Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And we are so glad you decided <laughs> to make us part of your day. Sorry. Also joining us, Mark Ellis. I'm a little upset about a bad basketball episode I had last night, but that was some of the finest jib work I've ever seen by Cody Hall. He literally does the jib, and he's walking out of the studio. He's <laughs> done. He drops the mic. <laughs> also joining us, Perry Nemiroff. One day I want to operate that jib. You will have an amazing shot, and I will likely break it, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> and also joining us, Christian Harloff. Yeah, while well, other people are going to see Billy Joel and Meet in the Rock, I was at Sesame Street Live. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I got you. How was that, by the way? I hear it's actually a very fun show. It was a, It was really good, and I think Brett Sheridan enjoyed it more than me. I just took him. There were no kids there. It was weird. <laughs> well, let's get to it. We do, as you can see on the uh, sidebar, we got a bunch of stuff that we're going to talk about today, but unfortunately... Uh, there's a, a couple of pieces of really unfortunate and sad news. Uh, a couple of, of people in our industry passed away. We start with uh, Paramount Pictures, former CEO and chairman of the board over Paramount Pictures, uh, Brad Gray, uh, passed away. Now, he stepped down a little while ago. We, we heard it was because of health issues that he had stepped down, but they confirmed this morning that he has passed away as a result of cancer. Um, so Brad Gray has passed away, but also passing away uh, an actor Every, he's one of these actors that everybody has seen him, everybody recognizes his face, and not everybody knows his name, but a bunch of you do. Uh, Powers Booth passed away as well. Uh, and, you know, when I think of, of Powers, he's been, first of all, he's been in a million things, but I will probably always first and foremost think of Deadwood. I just absolutely loved his character in Deadwood. I know he just recently appeared in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as well. He was, he was always active and busy and working. Um, and just two real you know, big, significant, influential people in our industry passing away. So it's tough to hear about this stuff. Yeah, when I think of Powers Booth, I think of Red Dawn and Tombstone. Those are the two oh, movies yeah, for me yeah. that stands out. He was a really great character actor. But it just overall, I mean, he just brought such a, to steal a word, a word from John Roca, gravitas, if you will, to everything that he that he did. Um, and it's really sad to see him go, but even more so with with Brad Gray, because it's so, so sudden. Like, the fact that it was, like, I didn't, had no idea he was sick. When he stepped down, like you said, we kind of assumed it was health issues. But what that guy did, um, I mean, from whether it's leading the charge with The Sopranos and getting David Chase to make that show and a bunch of other things that he was just instrumental in doing. He was at Brillstein Gray, the late Bernie Brillstein, um, and the way stuff that they were involved together, their company. Look at all the stuff. Just, just look at his, go to his IMDb page and look at all the things that he was involved in, and you'll be shocked with how instrumental he was in this business. Perry. Yeah, I mean this is the same thing that happens every time we cover passing. It's it's a, incredibly sad, but in these two cases it is also it's it's kind of incredible to look at their career cuz like you said before, Powers Booth, you know, you might not know his name, but I guarantee you you've seen him in something. And even though this is a really sad moment, this is the time when we get to sit down and look at his IMDb page, look at his resume and really appreciate everything he's brought to film over the years. And and the same thing with Brad Gray too, you know, we talk a lot about of the most famous faces out there, and that, that's kind of who we know. But someone like him who's been working behind the scenes for so long and has created so many incredible projects, it, it is kind of nice at this really sad time to be able to sit here and think about all the great things they've done. Yeah, I remember when Brad, uh, Brad Gray stepped down, we were all talking about, like, oh, well, what are the reasons? Is there just a shift going on at Paramount? But you look at, at the guy's iconic filmography, and you see all the projects that he got off the ground. It's an amazing body of work that guy has. And John you bring up Powers Booth, there's not a lot of people that could live up to the name Powers. Like there's, there's not a lot of kids coming out of the womb you're like, yeah, oh, that's going to be a Powers. Like Powers Booth, one of the best names I've ever heard, but he was also so good, and I mean this with all due respect, he aired legitimacy even to movies that may not have been A quality. I remember him from Rapid Fire. He was great <laughs> in Rapid Fire, and he was the bad guy in Sudden Death, one of the better Van Damme movies you'll see, directed by Peter Himes. Powers Booth, start to finish, always the guy who committed 100% to his role and that's a tremendous loss in Hollywood today. Uh, so, yeah, leave your thoughts in the comments section of your favorite projects you've seen both of these titans in this industry work on. All right, guys, we're going to decide that today. We're going to take let you guys basically program today's show. A lot of great questions came in in our mailbag. So all the topics today come from the questions that you guys have sent into us. 
By the way, if you want to send in questions to us, you can just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. So let's get to the first topic. Natasha, what's up? George Avicia writes, what are your thoughts on Diego Luna as the new Scarface? I have been following Diego's career since Itu Mama Tambien, and I think he's a very talented actor. With that said, I feel that Scarface is a classic and it should be left alone. Chris? I mean, look, I don't, you, a lot of people say that when they, they're going, I'm sure that this guy's referring to the Pacino movie. That's not the original. The original mm -hmm. was a remake. I mean, sorry, the Scarface with Pacino was a remake. 1932. It was. So um, I think that this, and I love Scarface with Pacino. I think it's it's a great movie. It's a great cult uh, cult movie. But it could be it could actually serve from a remake for everything like now what's going on. Look at a movie like uh, Sicario and putting that in a it, w with Scarface today. I mean, absolutely it could work. I think it. Uh, he's a great actor. I think he can bring something completely new to it. They're not going to do the same thing with Tony Montana and something else. If they, if they make that exact same movie, then yeah, that's that's a miss. But that's not the direction they're going to go in. They're going to go stuff that's happening kind of today with cartels. So I think it's a, a good move. Diego is just a really talented actor when you look at the body of work that he's already done he always plays something a little bit different than any movie he's been in before starting with you know he started pretty young in this business and he's worked his way up today and just to echo you know what Kristen said don't I, I, I'll never understand people who just think remake is a bad word like some of the most beloved movies in history are remakes like the Scarface you know and love that's a remake the fly with Jeff Goldblum that was a remake the Th John Carpenter's the thing was a remake you can make an argument that the Lord of the Rings was a remake, remake since there was an animated feature made of it previously. I mean, don't be turned off by that. But yeah, I think this guy is somebody who all of us have our eyes on to see what he's going to do next. It's not just because of Star Wars. He's been building and building and building. And he's got a couple of very high profile projects coming, not just Scarface, but he's got Flatliners coming as well. So remake. keep your eyes on Yeah, <laughs> remake. There you go. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm kind of warming up to the term reimagining more so than remake, even though, you know, we talk about remakes, reimaginings, reboots all the time. It's kind of silly to a point, but I'm a little torn on this. And the only example I could think of recently is a movie like Magnificent Seven. Mm. It didn't blow my mind. It was pretty good. I had fun with it, but it didn't even make that much money at the box office. And I'm not saying whether or not a movie is going to make a ton of money is what you deem whether or not a remake is, is worthy. But we are talking about a classic, and sometimes when I sit back and I think, you know, is this really going to make that much of an impression, whether or not it's an incredible movie or it makes a lot of money, is it really worth it? And I look at Scarface, and Scarface obviously is a classic, but at the same time, like, right, right now, if they announced that and it was coming out, it would be one of those things, I'm trying to think of another good example of an upcoming movie that I don't think is going to hit as well as it could, but... I really don't think there's going to be all that much interest in it. And I'm not just talking about us here at the table. I think we're all going to be curious. But you have to think that there's a whole generation of younger people out there that you're going to have to get interested in that movie. And I think it was the same thing with Magnificent Seven. Had a great opening week, and then it kind of fizzled out. And I just don't think that there is that many people out there clamoring for another Star Scarface story. However, if they start talking about this a little more and there's some, there's some sort of hook that makes it a little something special, maybe that's going to be the thing that's going to make it work. But until I hear more, all I have to go on is that Diego Luna is a great actor. I believe that uh, uh, the Coens are the ones who scripted this thing. And right now they're eyeing either Peter Berg or um, Hell or High Water director. Right. Uh, David McKenzie, is yeah, that his name? But that's uh, McKenzie. And, and if that's the package, it could be great. It's just I don't know if if this is really necessary. Yeah, but here's the thing. I mean, Magnificent Seven, I think, had a much tougher climb than Scarface is going to because I spent a lot of time in college kids' dorm rooms. They all still have Scarface posters on their wall. And people, uh, Scarface is an iconic movie, and that's why I think that they're releasing it under the name Scarface is because it really is going to help get clout. Like, a movie like Sicario didn't need to rely on a previous product to make it better because it was such a cool standalone movie i would hope that the same thing would happen with scarface like it's a totally different story it's going to take place on the west coast when you're talking about drug cartels from mexico coming into los angeles so i would like to see it not have to rely on scarface at all having said that i don't think the 1982 scarface is this legendary movie 
that is untouchable. I wouldn't be chanting overrated at it if it was a sports team, but I don't think it's the greatest movie ever made, so I think it can be touched in a way that I don't think Back to the Future or Beetlejuice or other classic 80s movies should ever be reimagined. As far as a remake goes, remake isn't a bad word because the originals that, that Scarface or that the thing were based on aren't the classics in the way that we know those more modern versions to be. But if you went to remake the thing now, I think people would say, oh, they you did. can't touch that thing. They hmm. did a prequel to it. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, and they just released it under the guise of the thing. Remember, the other, the other thing with Scarface Face, going off your point, is that critically it didn't, when Brian De Palma did that movie, critically it didn't do very well. Box office did okay. Hip hop music made Scarface very relevant. Right. Hip hop music in the like the mid '90s it really started. That's when it started to get more and more gain popularity. Um, and I don't, I, I disagree with you though, Perry. I think that there's the name itself will get people curious about it. But I think you put Peter Berg and and again give it like a Sicario type feel. I think that type of movie can do very well. But it's got to be done. It's got to be done right. I think that it, you don't want to make a remake doing the same exact story of what happened with Tony Montana. Similarities for sure. But a guy like Peter Berg or the director of Hell or High Water, um, and I think you can get for a lower budget. You don't spend too much money on this thing. I think you can do really well, and I think people will be wanting to see this movie. Peter Berg, and then also, just to go back to Magnificent Seven, look at the cast of that. As good as Diego sure. Luna is, unless they fill that cast with other people that are super, super well-known... I just don't see this being a but, scenario where you get people who are not aware of what Scarface is in those Yeah, seats. but Magnificent Seven was a movie in the 60s that, that was speaking to another audience. Like I mentioned before in the mid-90s, Scarface itself, the brand, does speak to a younger audience. It absolutely speaks to a younger audience. Uh, early 20s, late, late, te late teens. It's a completely different audience for what Magnificent Seven was going after and what Scarface is going after. I think Diego Luna should give a more grounded performance in Al Pacino did too. But he's proven he can do that. I mean, that guy's going to have multiple statues on his mantle when it's all said and done. Just look at what he did as Cassian Andor because ask anybody who was involved in the prequels, a Star Wars movie is not the easiest thing to step into and give a realistic, gritty feeling performance, but he knocked that out of the park. One of my favorite scenes in Rogue One is when he shoots his buddy in the back because that's how desperate yeah. we are in the current rebellion. Well, I think we can all agree, though, that if you're going to do a Scarface movie, you got to have Michael Bolton in it. Bonus points to you if you get the reference. All right, what's next? Spain Leo Bogasan writes, Hi, Collider crew. A big fan from Iceland here. I was wondering, do you think we'll ever see the Riddler in a movie again? He is one of my all-time favorite DC villains, but has never been portrayed in a good way on the big screen. What? Do you think we'll see him show up in the new DCEU, perhaps in Joss Whedon's Batgirl? Uh, you seem to have some uh, passion I about take this. issue with that. Frank Gorshin <laughs> was amazing as the Riddler. If you don't know who Frank Gorshin is, go watch him in the 1966 Batman. He also was great on every appearance he made on the Ed Sullivan Show. Now, having said that, it's probably time to update the character of the Riddler. The, 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 I, the question answer did specify the big screen. He, th that movie came out in theaters. Batman 66. Oh, that's that's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah. It did. Frank Gorshin right. was great in the TV show. And, and what Jim Carrey did as Edward Nigma is something that is clearly up for debate. I mean, I remember being a kid going in so excited about Batman Forever for multiple reasons. And just watching Tommy Lee Jones act with Jim Carrey and them both just overcooking it the wrong way was pretty disappointing. It was pretty crushing, to be honest with you. That movie's terrible for a lot of reasons, not just Jim Carrey's interpretation of the Riddler. You know what I would love is for current Jim Carrey to get another shot as the Riddler. But I think you can cast somebody else in that role in an upcoming Batman movie and make it different than what we know the Riddler to be in the same way that Heath Ledger took the Joker and turned that character on its ear a little bit. So, yeah, I would be up for seeing a Riddler on the big screen. Perry? I love Jim Carrey's The Riddler. I was just the perfect age when that movie came out, where my very first year in Sleepaway Camp, the poster that was hanging on my wall over my bed was a Batman Forever poster. And I freaking love Jim Carrey's The Riddler so much. He but was the best part. I think he was the best part of Batman. Forever. I had so, and still, I could watch clips of that and just get the biggest kick out of it to this day. But just going forward in general, I think The Riddler deserves another shot on the big screen. And there's so many actors that could do a lot with that role right now. Whether or not it's going to happen, I think I need to wait to see Wonder Woman and then Justice League just so I can get a better idea of where the DCEU might be heading because I don't really think we can predict anything at this moment, but I kind of want it to happen. I'm rooting for it. The late, great Robin Williams at one point was uh, rumored to play right. uh, yeah. in the Nolan movies, mm -hmm. supposed to play the Riddler, and even in even in the, the movie you're talking this the Joel Schumacher ones back then too. I Anytime someone says... 
ever again. The, we're, it's, I mean, we might be dead when it happens, but it'll happen eventually. Um, but I mean, it could happen in five years from now. I don't know. Just to say it'll never happen is, is silly. But it, the Riddler will be used. He's an iconic villain in the Batman universe. When? Who knows? Who knows when they've been talking about it, too? Um, Jim Carrey was fun, obviously. But that was in the height of Jim Carrey powers. And he was just, he was just doing a Jim Carrey impression. It wasn't really the Riddler. It was a really dopey movie. But uh, but the fact it's it's I mean, when you see it in the theater at 10 years old or whatever, or, or, or probably you, too. Um, Thanks for making excuses for me. No, but but when you go when you see it, when you see the movie uh, that it's it's fun. But there hasn't been a good interpretation of the character just yet. He was doing what he had to in a Joel Schumacher fart box. <laughs> um, it's t look, I like the Riddler character very much in the comics. And I actually, even though I'm not a big fan of the Gotham TV series, I can't remember the name of the actor, but the actor Cameron they have, Monaghan, right? Is that what his name is? I, I believe. I, I mean, I have not. Or am I thinking of the wrong one? I have no idea. But the guy who's playing the Riddler in, <laughs> in Gotham, the, no. their incarnation of it is I actually kind of dig it. But the way comic book movies are made today, I just don't know that that character fits into the kind of worlds they're creating right now. Um, like, they're going more towards villains like Deathstroke and, and, and characters like that that can be physical challenges as well as mental challenges at the same time. So I, I just don't know. I agree with you completely. You never say never. At some point, you know, Riddler... I, I do see the possibility of a character like the Riddler playing a small role, much like Scarecrow played right. in the Nolan Batman films. I could see him popping up, like you've got Edward Diggins. They Diggler set it up in Batman vs. Superman, didn't they? Like in the one, uh, like he's got, when he's down. Well, there's a the... green question mark. Right. I think that was just more of a little wink right. to everybody. But this does remind me of, I mean, there are like the four occasions in my career when I have gotten the most crap from people. Okay. This, this you have them connects, on your wall. When I, when I, well, yeah, there are four occasions. Number one was when I said this Halo movie that Peter Jackson is performing, that is producing, is never going to happen. I got so much shit for that. Never happened. Uh, you know, when I said, okay, don't I don't care what J.J. Abrams says. Benedict Cumberbatch is going to be con. Got <laughs> so much shit for that, and that's what happened. When I said, no, the next two Avengers movies are not one movie being split into two. They're two separate movies. So much shit for that. But the biggest one I got the most crap for, and this goes back away. We're going back almost 10 years now. There was this report going around, and everybody bought it, that the next Nolan movie, I believe it was going to be the third one, the next Nolan movie is going to have Johnny Depp as Riddler and Philip Seymour Hoffman as the Penguin. Ooh. That was rumored. I remember that. Yeah, that yeah. was that. everywhere, and everybody believed it. And I remember I got on my show that I was doing at the time, and I was like, idiots. Nolan has said he hasn't even written the script of this thing yet. Right. We don't even know what characters are in it. No. Johnny Depp has not signed on to be the real, and Philip Seymour Hoffman has not signed on to be the Penguin. And I just got, for about a month, I got so much hate mail. As a matter of fact, the video I have up on YouTube right now, where I'm telling people this is not happening, <laughs> even though it never happened, I still get hate on it. Well, you got, <laughs> I, I, was they, like, I just got tweeted in, you got a fifth one now, too. Oh, yeah. Cumberbatch. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. What do you call him? Cumber oh, and, oh, oh, and, and by the way, and by the way, when Ben Affleck isn't Batman anymore after the first standalone Batman right. movie, and I think it's only 50-50, he's gonna be he's gonna be even Batman in that. That'll be the fifth one. But yeah, that reminds me of that. But I, I can see a Riddler being like a smaller. It's character. Corey Michael Smith oh, as, uh, as Nigma and yeah. Gotham. Yeah, hey. I actually think he's really good in that. I think he's one of the best parts of the show. I would love to believe Perry, but I don't trust anybody that says sleepaway camp. Back in my <laughs> day, it was, just, it was just called camp. It was camp. There's camp was a, a place you slept okay, away at. So there's two different camps. There's there's day camp. Day and camp is not a thing. Camp. That's daycare for adults. It's not a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go to camp? You stay away from your where, parents for two. Who did a better, where did you grow up? Who did a better version of Edward Enigma? Was it was it Jim Carrey or Jamie Foxx in the last Spider-Man movie? It's the same exact role. That really was him, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'll go Jim oh, it's Carrey. The same exact role. I'll go Jim Carrey. Frank Corshin. All right. What's next? Okay, it's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report. For the second weekend in a row, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 sat at the number one spot at the box office, delivering an estimated $63 million for a domestic total now at $246.2 million. In the number two spot was Fox's Snatch, starring Amy Schumer and Goldie Hawn. The comedy brought in an estimated $17.5 million in its first weekend in release. In the number three spot was King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. The movie opened well below expectations with an estimated $14.7 
$1.7 million on an estimated budget of $175 million. And number four was Fate of the Furious, which took in $5.3 million for a domestic total now at $215 million. And at number five was The Boss Bebe, bringing in $4.6 <laughs> million with Boss a domestic Bebe. total now at $162.4 million. John, thoughts on the weekend box office? I mean, great results again, right in that 50% range, uh, dropping for Guardians of the Galaxy 2, opening against not such strong competition. I'll be honest with you, Snatch did a little bit better than I thought. I, I know there were some early numbers I thought was going to be like 27, 28, so it's below that, but I thought it was going to be like 9, to be honest with you. So it did much better than I thought. King Arthur. <sighs> wow. A $175 million movie mm. opens with about 15 million bucks. And I like the film. I had fun with it. I am, I am unapologetic about that. I know a lot of the other critics hate it. That's fine. That's fair. I watched it and I liked it. And I thought it deserved better than that. But wow, there are now marketing companies around this city sitting down and analyzing now where did this go wrong, that they couldn't even get an initial batch of audience out. Because I know they were, it was tracking at about 23, 24, 25, but even that was miserable. Like, that would have been terrible for a $175 million movie. So, yeah, great news for Guardians. It's already, it's already cracked over $600 million worldwide, so it's doing very well, positioned very well, all that kind of stuff for a bunch of characters that a couple of years ago none of us have ever even heard of. So, uh, yeah, anyway, Mark, your thoughts on the box Well, unfortunately, office. John, it looks like King Arthur's going to sleepaway camp, and he's not coming back <laughs> anytime soon. I mean, even because I really like the movie, but even watching it, there's no chance in hell that I would watch that and say, yeah, I'd spend $175 million on yeah. that. Snatched impressed me because it made $17 million. I think it only cost a little over $40 million to make. If you want a silver lining for King Arthur, and there's not much of one, but I think it'll do better internationally than something like Snatched will. I think so it, far, it might, worldwide yeah. total. It might play well. Including in, overseas and including North it America. In England. It has made $44 million oh, okay. worldwide. Well, hey, Guardians, good job. 57% drop. When you have a 57% drop and you still make $66 million, yeah. that's awesome. That thing is made north of $246 million just in the United States. Hell of a number. And Boss Baby, God damn, you're going to be on the top five until the end of the summer. Congratulations, <laughs> you little tyke. Perry. I don't think uh, King Arthur opened in all the foreign markets yet, but it did open in China, and I don't think it did very well there. I think it still yeah, has no, the UK not. and a couple other big ones there, but that is not going to save the movie at this Show point. Show me and England! It's, <laughs> it's so sad, though, just because of what you said. I mean, it was not a great movie, but I certainly didn't see anything to hate. I had a lot of fun, and it left me kind of curious to see what they would have done with a sequel. That's not oh, happening no. at all. <laughs> that is not Wow, happening. I feel awful for them though i mean just so many years and so much money went into that production and it just freaking bombed but on the bright side i look at the box office report and i'm thinking that i'm gonna win our box office bets last weekend because guardians is crushing it and mm -hmm. i think guardians is still gonna make a lot of money this weekend even though it's got some more competition but that movie is gonna have legs i'm telling you did any of us pick do you know if anybody on friday's show or the box office prediction picked Arthur? snatched oh. to beat arthur no, I don't think I, I, that, I, I'll be impressed if somebody did. I don't I, know. That would have been a great oh, one. Oh, no, wait, I hosted that program. Yes, and, you did. Uh, we didn't do box office predictions live. We did it. it oh, that's afterwards. right. We did after afterwards. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, that would have beaten it. I think Guardian is going to be in the top three. I don't think it has a shot after if, if second weekend of, of, of 50. I don't think it has a shot to be number that's one. That's a good second weekend. It's week a great second weekend, but not for, number, not for number one. I, I'm telling you, there's no shot. You're uh, going to be, be hard pressed to find a movie that does better than $66 million. In weekend two, Spider Man might be able to do it. That's what I'm talking about. About. I, I think you and I pick Spider Man. I think that there are I think that there are a couple movies out there that have a chance. Yeah. I think Guardian's gonna be in the top three. But anyway, it's a different conversation. As far as Snatch doing what it did, I agree with you. I would have because after seeing the movie, I thought it would have done a lot worse. See, I thought that movie should have done worse um for what we were predicting than King Arthur. Like King Arthur is, is not a great movie, like Perry was saying, but I it certainly should have done better than it did. But the problem with this is one Charlie Hunnam is not a, a big enough star to be leading in a $200 million movie yet. Uh, two, Guy Ritchie hasn't shown that he can do these types of big blockbuster movies yet, because Man From U.N.C.L.E. was a smaller movie. This movie should have been approached. This was a bad move by executives. This is an exe this, like The executives that, that greenlit this thing made a bad call here to 
put that much money. And the other thing is these type of epics traditionally have not been doing well lately. They just haven't been doing well. And King Arthur was another story that had been told a bunch of times. Yeah, they put a new spin on it, but that wasn't enough to, to say, well, no, no, but they're going to do King Arthur, except they're going to throw elements of Snatch in there, an independent film that a, a handful of people saw. Okay, cool, $200 million. It's lunacy. It's, it is absolute lunacy that they put that much. This movie should have cost $80 million tops, and it still would have made a loss if it cost $80 million. So... It's too bad because the movie itself wasn't that bad. Um, but and Boss Baby, the fact that Boss <laughs> is still in there kicking ass. You I love think. that movie. And I don't you love that. No, I didn't love actually. Boss Not baby. as much as Rock Talk. <laughs> he got, he's got a giant Boss Baby tattoo on his back it's shoulder. True. <laughs> on his back left shoulder. That's Alec Baldwin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, All right. What's next? Okay, Eric Patermo writes, Hey guys, greetings from Connecticut. I just watched The Kingsman again, and I have a theory re Colin Firth's character Galahad. He was shot in his left eye through his glasses, but his glasses could have been bulletproof. So he loses his eye, but never actually dies. Thoughts? Look, I mean, we knew from the moment, first of all, I was super excited to hear that Colin Firth was coming back, because I love that character. That was just great, and I think the chemistry that him and Eggsy is, is wonderful, and I was super glad. But even though I was happy, it is a bit of a head-scratcher. There's not a lot of wiggle room when Samuel Jackson puts a gun in the face and <laughs> shoots you in the face. There's not a lot of room around that. Now, yes, he does have an eye patch on and the thing there. So look, they've got to come up with something. So maybe the bulletproof glasses is one, because um, apparently if you get shot anywhere else in the face, you can survive that. you got to cover the eyes. So it's surviving the bulletproof uh, eyeglasses, fine. That could be it, I suppose. I just really hope they don't go the route of, this is his twin brother, or th this is a clone. I mean, I don't know how else they do it, but I really hope your theory is correct. What do you think, Barry? Ooh, I hope they don't go that route either. That'd be awful. I really admired them for doing that to that character because it completely changed the tone and the stakes of the last bit of the movie. It did, and a lot. And as much as I liked Colin Firth in the movie and I wanted to you know, see more of that character because I think there's a lot more that you can bring out of that character, especially given his relationship with Eggsy and the fact that Eggsy's journey is definitely not complete after that first movie, I think it is kind of a shame that they're mm. backtracking a little and bringing him back. But one way or the other, they're going to have to explain how he survived that because I've watched that scene over and over trying to look for for some little thing that I might have missed or, or anything, and I can't come up with a reason. And also, after he shoots him, they cut to some reactions, and some of those reactions are... They're, they're all shocked, and I feel like one of those people, if he had some sort of bulletproof uh, glasses on, would, would have known, oh, he's got a shot because he was wearing our special Kingsman glasses, but <laughs> that didn't read at all, so I don't know. This is this is crazy, but I'm still psyched for this. I mean, people are watching that scene like it's a Zabruder film, and I need to go back and watch and analyze, because I remember seeing it in the theater and thinking, like, you just saw a bunch of like, blood and guts and brain splatter everywhere. Apparently you didn't, so as long as they make the explanation fun... I'm up for anything because what I got out of the first Kingsman movie is that we're having a great time telling this story. It doesn't need to take place in the world of reality for me. As long as you rationalize it with some sort of like James Bondy Q glasses that were bulletproof or he has a twin like the legend of Curly's gold, I don't care. Just make it fun for me. <laughs> Colin Firth with an eye patch alone is enough reason to bring that character back. Even if he did get his brains blown apart and they just taped them back together, put Colin Firth in an eye patch. He looks like a badass. I'm in. Let's go to the White Show. Let's take a look at this picture here that we see. He's looking pretty good for a guy shot in the face. Snake yeah. Bliskin. He is. Yeah, he was recovered well. Or what Captain Ron. Uh, I love your theory with the glasses. Uh, I think we're getting copped out with the twin brother or the clone. I think it's no. going to be a ruse. Yeah, I think it's going to be a ruse. I think the fact that he's going to say this whole thing, that it was like, oh, I, I recovered and blah, blah, blah. But we're going to find out he's working for the other side and he's a bad guy. And whether or not he's, or he could have Ooh, a fake. Or he could I have like a, the bad Or guy. he could have a fake mm. face or like a Mission Impossible fake face thing. Uh, it could be something like that. I don't They're, think they'll do the fake faces because Mission Impossible. So whatever. Yeah. Well, but they do these plays off the spy genre. All the, that's, that's what this movie is. They, it, like the music from the music to everything else is a, is a spoof on the spy genre so they haven't done the fake face thing yet i wouldn't be surprised and in order to pull it off they pull the little patch there i don't think that's that's the i, think, I think you're onto something with the uh him being the bad guy that's what it is like them creating he's infiltrating. some sort of he's yeah, infiltrating yeah but he's galahad 
All right. I don't What's think he next? Is. <laughs> Vanessa Rodriguez writes: Pacific Rim is one of my favorite guilty pleasure movies, and I love Son Sons of Anarchy. But with Charlie Hunnam not really getting high praise for his acting in either of those, and with King Arthur getting destroyed at the box office this weekend, do you see any sort of future for him? Well, Sons of Anarchy is actually one of my top three favorite television shows of all time. Wow. Uh, up there with Battlestar Galactica and Spartacus. Or as the Italians call it, Sons of Anarchy is, uh, is what we <laughs> use. What, the way, I, I kid you not, my uncle said it that way once. <laughs> um, and I, so look, I, I am, and I also actually, Pacific Rim is a movie I have an unapologetic amount of fun with. I love that. This is going to be tough for Charlie Hunnam because not only is you know the, the movie itself, it is a movie that he is the headliner of. It is the movie, if we can take a peek of that shot over there, it is the movie, we can't really see it, but it's a movie that with him on the poster and him featured prominently in the trailers and it only managed to scrape together $14 million. I mean, that's bad enough it was a $60 million movie. It's a $175 million movie. I really like Charlie Hunnam. Actually, uh, 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 Josh McCougan and I, at Comic-Con last year, we were walking down, and Josh McCoog was wearing one of his world-famous, incredibly loud suits. I think he had the American Stars and Stripes pants on, right? Suit. And we walk around this corner, and we practically bump into Charlie Hunnam. And Charlie Hunnam, on his own, initiates, dude, those pants. <laughs> and he's just, you know, he's super sweet. And I've talked to him before. He's very engaged. He's a super nice guy. You couldn't hope for anything better for anybody. I, but I'll be honest, I didn't think he was all that great in Pacific Rim. I, I thought the movie was a lot of fun. I didn't think he added a lot to it, being the lead. I liked him in this movie, but it's it's going to be tough for another studio at this point to go, yes, let's cast Charlie Hunnam in the lead of our next film. Coming off of something like this, it's... Uh, I'm going to cheer for him, but it's got it's a long road ahead. He's got to do what Taylor Kitsch did. After Taylor Kitsch was getting these big, huge pushes in... in what was the what, battleship, and then he was, and then the John, John, John Carter, and those things bombed. We're, we're having the same conversations at the end of him, and then he did things like Lone Survivor, and even though True, smaller side roles, yeah, but yeah. even though True Detective season two on its uh, wasn't very good, he was really good in it. Um, like these these little things, these side roles that Charlie Hunnam's going to have to start doing to get himself back into it. You're right, no studio. Not with this big of a loss. Yeah. They're, they're going to say, because it's not his fault, because I agree with you. I actually thought he was pretty good in this movie. I thought he did for the, I was interested in watching him in this entire movie. He was movie. definitely a guy, Richie King Arthur. He was and great. He, he, was, he was really good in the movie, but it's still, it's like being the, he, he's the lead singer of the band. And they're all going to, even though everything might have went wrong with the tour, uh, they're going to look at the, the lead singer. And that's what's going to happen with him right now. And he's he, he's got a little bit of a road. I don't think he's dead in his career, but he's got he's going to have to do a lot of stuff. Leading man, it, it's going to take a while to get back there. Okay. I don't know. I think it might be, for his sake at least, a blessing in disguise that this turned out to be such a blip on the radar. Because if it had made a little more money and maybe if we had been talking about it a little more, you would have been saying, oh, you know, him in that movie. I mean, that's the end of his career. But I think this is going to go away so fast. You think he'll and lead also, more stuff? I, I think the lasting conversation from King Arthur is going to be more so uh, that Guy Ritchie can't deliver a box office smash. Not that he's not your leading man. And I wouldn't be surprised if he did wind up with another big budget project. Mm -hmm. Maybe not something of this scale. Because, you know, clearly his box office record is not the greatest. I don't think that means that his career is dead. It certainly doesn't mean he's not a good actor. I think he's great. I mean, one of his favorite movies of mine is Green, Green Street Hooligans, which I watch a little too much. But he definitely has something. I think it's more of an issue of him not pairing maybe with the right director and material to bring out what's so special about him. So I don't know. I, I definitely don't think it's worth saying his career is dead. Yeah. His career's not dead. I, I, I have, I have a, a problem feeling sorry for anybody with abs that great. You know, like <laughs> you're that good looking, your life's gonna be just fine. If this was Danny DeVito's big shot to be King Arthur, I would lament for days that you got your chance and you missed it, and it's probably not gonna come back again. But guys like him, Taylor Kitsch, they're gonna be just fine. They may not be leading men like Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt, but something like this, you gotta lick your wounds a little bit, take your time, do some side rolls, do the Christian Harloff formula. You're gonna get back. You're gonna have another shot. I agree with you, John. I didn't think he was good in Pacific Rim at all, but I thought he was really good in. King Arthur. So I think he's improving. As far as be becoming an actor and expanding his range, he's on the right path. He just needs better projects to choose. Sons of Anarchy, top three? 
Top three. All time? All time. Have you seen Breaking Bad? I have. You've seen Mama's Family, Sports Center, Family Guy, <laughs> Alf? <laughs> you, you, you lost me there a little bit at, at one point. Oh, check out Mama's Family. It's, it's underrated. All right, what's next? Ninja Transformers writes, can either it, Lego, Ninjago, or Kingsman 2 bring this, break the September opening weekend record currently held by Hotel Transylvania 2? Thanks for taking my question, and have a great day. Remember when I first saw this question, I had to double check. It was really, is Hotel Transylvania mm -hmm. 2 the current reigning world champion? And do you know what's right behind it? <laughs> no. Hotel Transylvania. <laughs> really? The first is. Hotel Transylvania. Yeah. Well, Hotel Transylvania 2 made $46 million in its opening weekend, and that apparently is good enough to hold up. I think I would have thought, I would have thought that Lego Ninjago could be the champion here had you asked me before we saw what happened with Lego Batman. Because Lego Batman was great and it has the Batman name on it. It's coming off of a great Lego movie with the Lego movie. And the Batman movie did not do anywhere near the numbers that we thought it was going to do. I think Lego Ninjago will do less than the Batman Lego movie will. So I don't see it being the one. It, I cannot wait for this movie, but I don't think it's gonna break box office records. When you look at the current records, $46 million, Kingsman 1, which caught everybody by surprise, opened at 36 million. The notion that now it's now beloved by everybody, of it just, all it needs to do is open to 10 million more than it did its first time around, yes. Kingsman 2 will break the September opening weekend box office. I think it'll shatter it. I think it'll be 60 plus. Yeah, I don't think, I, I can't wait to see it. And, and I'm normally not excited for horror films. It doesn't have a chance uh, because of the audience. Uh, it's got a limited audience that, that it's going after. But I think it's going to do very well. But I think it'll start to tack on opening weekend. No, I totally agree with Lego. I think that it's just that people are not flocking to see the, the movie like because Batman itself should have done better than it did. I mean, it opened at 53, which isn't bad. Which we is thought yeah, Lego after, Batman would have done like yes, 80, Especially 90. after how loved the Lego movie yeah. was. Uh, so no, and Ninjago is, is not as a well-known property. And I think Kingsman, because summer movies will be winding down in August, you're going to get like, I think, Dark Tower, and then there's like maybe one other one that's big, and then the rest of it, you start to get the stinky movies that come out in, in August. So September normally is when crap is out until we get to the Oscar season. So putting a sequel like Kingsman that you said open to 35, it's got a good shot. I think it opens just around like between 47 and 50 million. I think one of them might do it. That might be wishful thinking. I'm going to take out Ninjago for the reason you said, because Batman only made 53, and I think Ninjago can only come in behind that. And actually, Hotel Transylvania, is it would be 48.5 million mm. that it would have to be, which it's a nice chunk of change. And so if, you know, let's say Ninjago makes 45, clearly that doesn't do it. And I think that's even a high number, because you know how long it took me to figure out how to pronounce Ninjago? <laughs> it's like, even though it's Lego Ninjago, it's still, people are looking at that other name, and I think some folks out there might not know what it is, so it might not get that draw. I think I'm leaning towards it being a surprise, though. Wow. And, and it's not just because I love horror and I want to see it do well, but it does have a Stranger Things kind of vibe it in it. And not just because it has one of the kits from Stranger Things in it. It's got a great marketing campaign so far where... Isn't that one of like the the highest viewed trailers of the, the year? The trailer or something? broke records, records yep. man, all I, time. And you know, okay, so Hotel Transylvania two is the highest earner of September, followed by Hotel Transylvania. The one that comes after that is Insidious Chapter two with forty million. So I, that just says to me that if it's not an animated movie, it could be a horror movie. That there is a market for horror at that time. So I'm kind of thinking that that's going to be it. Although, just to give Kingsman 2 some credit, I do think it's going to be one of those anomalies where the sequel does make a little more than the first movie. So I think all three are going to wind up doing pretty well. I will throw this out there just as, as one quick counterpoint. The movie that came out, the trailer that came out to break Star Wars The Force Awakens record for most <laughs> yeah, views exactly. of the trailer hmm. was Fifty Shades Darker. It made $46 million opening weekend. So... Uh, but it, you, it is it is something to keep an eye on. Though. I, I think you're right. It may surprise a lot of people. Yeah, unlike the Fifty Shades Darker trailer, people were raving about the It trailer. They That's weren't watching yep, it to go make difference. fun of it. They were watching because they wanted to get scared out of their minds. I think It has a great shot. I think you look up. Can you look up the Paranormal Activity opening numbers, Perry? Get those on my well, desk by Tuesday. They're <laughs> not right though because that movie opened limited, so it's you, you can't make the same comparison. <sighs> Perry, nice try, you have though. To bring nice facts try. Into my point, 
and I we think were, that we were it agreeing is, on something. It was we nice. We were because I think that <laughs> it. I, but here's the thing: it opens before you have Lego Ninjago and Kingsman Two opening. So I think it could open and do 50 million opening weekend, and then then Kingsman Two could come out a couple weeks later and break its new record for September. Because I think it is going to do fantastic opening weekend box office. Now, the thing about Kingsman Two is that it opens the same weekend as Lego Ninjago. Now it's not a lot of crossover because Kingsman Two is probably going to be rated R. I would yeah, imagine yeah. Lego Ninjago. I think is not going to do well. Not only because of the Batman Lego thing, which everybody loved, and it made money, it just didn't do as well as the Lego movie. They showed a clip of Lego Ninjago, I think, during Lego Batman. Yeah. And, oh my God, it was like, give this thing the light. This is not working out the way they thought. Nobody in the audience was laughing. So I, I think Lego Ninjago has an uphill climb. And I will say this too, the all-time record for most money made for a September movie opening. Do you guys know what it is? Not opening weekend, entire domestic run. It came out in 1986. Oh. Yeah. Number one is 86. Number two is Hotel Transylvania. Number three came out in 1987. Terminator? Crocodile Dundee, baby. All right. Oh, <laughs> that's not a knife. This is a knife. And this is your opening weekend box office report from 1986. Brought to you by Mark Ellis. All right. What's next? <laughs> Willie Bush writes, Diane Lane was recently asked if she thought Justice League would be better than the Avengers, and she said no. Do you <laughs> think she is just assuming or has some knowledge of how the film will be? What is your assumption of how the film will perform critically? Well, just to paint the picture for you so you have the context for this. Yeah, Diane Lane. I saw this uh, over the weekend. Uh, so Diane Lane is on this, uh, on this talk show. She's being interviewed, and they took in some live callers. And this live caller called in and asked two questions. She asked, number one, can you give us any Justice League spoilers? Number two, is Justice League going to be better than the Avengers? To which Diane Lane replied, no and no, short but honest. So asked two questions, is, uh, can you give us Justice League spoilers? And number two, is it going to be better than the Avengers? She said, no and no, short but honest. Now, of course... Her reps, uh, phones they blew up with calls from Warner Brothers, I'm sure. And then her reps immediately started putting out uh, some damage control statements. Honestly, though, I know it looks bad. But, but I honestly just think it was Diane Lane being pro and gracious. I, I think it was honestly just Diane Lane being pro and gracious. Much like the way, like... When somebody asks, like LeBron James, are you the greatest basketball player of all time? He goes, hey, there's Michael Jordan, there's Wilt. The, I, I've got a long way to go. You know, Maybe he is the greatest basketball player of all time, but he's just going to say, maybe he thinks he's the greatest basketball player of all time, but he's going to say the professional courteous thing. I Yeah, I watched it the first time and went, what is she saying? But honestly, I think she just meant it as being professional and courteous and gracious and humble with, with her movie. I don't think she's making an announcement like I, I will admit the way she goes look sh I'm just being honest that threw me off a bit but honestly I think she's just being gracious I really do I think she's just being pro humble and gracious and I wouldn't read any more into it than that what do you think yeah I, I, I think that if you would have asked any, anything to her at that point for what she was saying was you look at the initial question when the, the, the girl goes can you give me spoilers she's like and then whatever it was, like, and and is your name Diane Lane? No, no, and no. I can't answer anything. No, no, and no. I, I don't think she was saying, no, it's terrible. Of course it's not better than the Avengers. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that, that, I think if anybody reads into that, uh, you know, regardless of being honest or whatever she was doing, I think she was on the show. She was having some laughs with the host. This call came in. She's like, no, I'm not going to be able to answer this. So no and no. And I don't, I don't think you should read into it whatsoever. Mark. John, Diane Lane is a beacon of light in a cruel universe, and us <laughs> heathen mutants should be honored every time we get to bathe in her majestic glow. I don't think she was talking about Justice League versus Avengers at all. I literally think she was just saying no to say no. I think I agree with Christian. Like, if somebody asks you something about a property and you know you're not supposed to give spoilers, you're not sure exactly where the line is, you turn something in your brain off and you just say no, 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 no. And sometimes you can say no, and it actually means yes. I'm going to cite the classic Hootie and the Blowfish song, Hold My Hand. You know, at the end, when Darius Rucker starts, no, 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 no. He's actually singing, yeah, he wants to hold her hand. Uh, wow. Perry. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing to say about that. But uh, no, I agree with you. No and no is just a, a saying. And I'd like to bet that on the show, if the question had been reversed and someone had said, is it as good as Avengers? She might have had a different response. But because of that spoiler thing that came first, 
Yeah, I, I mean, for all I know, with lights on me, and if I wasn't really paying, for, for all we know, she didn't even fully hear right. what the next half of yep. it was. Her mind was just like, I'm going to say just like no and no, because I can't talk about this movie at all. So uh, don't don't read into it. <laughs> All right, guys, I want to remind you that, of course, uh, Movie Talk is not the only show that we have on Collider Video. A little bit later today, the brand new episode of TV Talk comes with Josh McCougan and his crew. Keep your eyes open for that. Of course, Alien Covenant is opening up, and we already have our non-spoiler review for that up. Just look on our main page and look under Movie Reviews. We have our review for Alien Covenant there. A brand new behind-the-scenes and bloopers video aired this weekend, as well as two new episodes of Collider Mailbag. And, of course, every Friday, brand new episodes of Awesome Tacular with our very own Jeremy Johns. All right, guys, we're now going to save a little bit of time here at the end of the show for your live Twitter questions. I know a bunch of you guys are watching us live. Just fire in some questions to us. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video. Send them on in. Wendy's been over there monitoring the Twitter stream. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Ross H., who writes, We talk a lot about box office numbers. How do those compare to the money a film makes after the theater? It makes the, the by far its lion's share of money gets made in theater. That that's where it makes its money. Um, it's actually been making. I just read this great uh, article in Variety not long ago about how tracking like year over year over year the money that a film makes post home video release, starting back in the VHS days or maybe even Laserdisc, but VHS to DVD to Blu-ray live streaming that that the uh, revenue's actually been dropping a bit, but these new technologies have been opening up avenues for films that maybe never would have gotten a theatrical release to make more money than they ever would have because they never would have hit theaters, but now they have live streaming revenue. But if you're talking about these big films, it's, it's you know, you're talking about maybe, you know, 5 to 10% can be added to the overall thing. It's, a, it's relatively a smaller number. What do you guys have to say? No, I mean, I, I was always curious about it also, like how... Like what the deals are that are made, like whether now if something goes towards streaming and something goes towards when it's cable, like how much money the movie makes revenue for that. I know it's, it's studio makes certain money when, when certain networks pick it up or certain streaming services pick it up or Blu-ray serves digital codes. Like I, I, I don't pretend to know all that stuff, but I'm very curious about it. Yeah, I wish uh, Box Office Mojo would eventually come to a point where they can add on revenue from DVD yeah. sales compared to VOD releases, because I mean, I don't really know the firm answer to that either. The only way I can answer is just with my experience with, with Child Eater and seeing how, you know, seeing what portion of those sales we get versus the distributor versus the, right. you know, the, the outlets and the streaming services that have picked it up. So it, it's an interesting thing, and I think it varies from place to the place and I really do think it's only a matter of time before resources like Box Office Mojo start to share that information. I certainly want it. You know it's still making a lot of money? Hootie and the Blowfish cracked rear view. <laughs> what an album that was. God, it was a phenomenon in the mid-90s still today. You know, there's one movie that I would bet my life savings on, which is a few pennies, that I think is doing better than its box office run on the home video digest and DVD, Blu-ray, whatever. Office Space. I bet you that movie oh, yeah. did I, better on home formats than in theater. I think there are probably a couple of films oh, yeah. that uh, those are the Fight exceptions Club. that prove the rule. Fight Club didn't do well in the theater. Fight Club didn't do that well. No, yeah. The Room I hear didn't do that well. Yeah. <laughs> it, but they keep playing it in theaters every month. Yeah. Every month it gets played. Box true. Office keeps climbing. <laughs> keeps going up. Alright, what's next? Prodigy writes, with the disappointing numbers in China this weekend, what are the chances of a Power Ranger no. sequel? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Perry. Ooh. I knew that question was going to come up. No, uh, no, 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 yeah, no, actually, no. I'm Percentage? It's, yeah, uh, it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go about 10%. Good. 10%. And that's high. <laughs> uh, that's, it was tough, man. Look, China was there. It was, it was the last kind of nail in the coffin, I think, that they were, because something like the last Transformers movie, totally different comparison as far as overall box office, but it did okay, the, the last Transformers compared to the other ones, but it crushed overseas, like crushed. And overseas marketing, a lot of these movies are going after, so they were doing that with the Power Rangers, and it didn't work out, uh, and I don't think it was. it's going to... No, we're getting that. not getting another one. Yeah, Perry, I think that uh, Power Rangers made it to the last preseason game. They made it to the last cut, and now it's Monday morning. Uh, the assistant coach is going to walk into the locker room and say, Power Rangers, grab your playbook. Coach needs to see you. Red tag in, like, Major League. <laughs> um, Sports analogy made it Wow, worse. okay, yeah. No, I'll, I know a lot of people were really hoping that the box office for Power Rangers at China was going to save everything. Power Rangers made $1.2 million. In, in, its, in its Chinese opening. Oh, my God. Uh, so uh, the, the headline, Forbes right now is running a headline. Don't, don't, just don't read it. 
I can't read it. Read it. it. <laughs> the headline in Forbes fair. right now is box office. We are probably not getting a Power Rangers sequel. It's so overdone. I'm not going to believe a headline like that until I hear the word from Lionsgate. Because okay, it it is not making a lot of money overseas. However, there's still a case to be made for the fact that Lionsgate has so much invested in this franchise that they might be in a position where they kind of have no choice but to give the sequel a go, maybe with a lower budget, just to see if they could revive it. I will fully admit, even as a big Power Rangers fan, I don't think this is the kind of scenario where a Power Rangers 2 has any shot of making more money than a Power Rangers 1. But I still don't think a sequel is completely off the table. It is a little less likely. There's no denying that after it didn't do well in China of all markets. But I really would not be surprised if Lionsgate was still committed to making another movie. Uh, Power Rangers 2 is absolutely off the table. Uh, I, I, just, I just don't see how, look, the first one, and you know what? I said this a thousand, it's color me shocked. I liked the Power Rangers movie. I did not think I would, and I liked it. I told people you should go see it. I mean, so I, and who would have thought I would be saying that, but I did, I liked the movie. But I, look, we've known for a long time, like everybody thought, you know, when I'd say, this is not a movie, you shouldn't be coming out and announcing you're gonna make a seven film franchise. Oh, stupid. This is not, and people say, John, you don't know what you're talking about. Go to the conventions, the lineups are around the block. This is gonna make a billion dollars worldwide. Sure, if by billion dollars you mean lunch money. No, I mean, look, overall worldwide it's made $135 million, which look, I will never make a movie that makes $135 million in my life. The movie lost money for the studio. It lost them a bunch of money. And here's the th this is the problem you face with the Power Rangers too. This was the first movie where they didn't even introduce the Zords until we were like in the last 15% of the film. So you didn't have to have all the big visual effects and the power suits and the Zords and the battle in the city. You didn't have to do all that. You can't get away with that in a sequel. You can't do now a Power Rangers 2 and not have Zords or the power suits or battles show up until halfway through the third act. A sequel will not cost less money. It will cost more right. money. And with the with the critic response, despite the fact that I hate or that I, I enjoyed it, it didn't get great critic responses. It didn't get great audience responses. There's no reason to assume that a Power Rangers two will make more money than Power Rangers one did. I actually think did. it did get a really good uh, audience response. So not in terms of box I, office. I mean, I just know. like cinema score. People who did see it really did love it. I mean, I loved it. You know, I did. But I just don't think you can make a rational business case if you're, if I'm in the Lionsgate business offices the right now. The risk is higher than a reward. The risk is much higher, and I think it, I just don't see how you do it for less money and expect more money in return. But a hell of an effort by yeah. Nemiroff here. Yeah. I mean, she is sugarcoating this story like the glazed waterfall of Krispy Kreme. I mean, she's realistic. just trying. Or you're trying it, your ass off. I, I'm try I am trying, and I do have just a little bit of hope that it really, it really can happen. I'm not just saying that because I'm a fan, but I would be an idiot to not realize that the chances are, are slimming down less and less every day that this I, doesn't do well but in the I'm box office. I, I'll, I never thought I'd say this. I want to see a I do, too. I want to see yeah. them do another one. I really do. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, let's take one more today. Oh, Perry, I'm so sorry. I've never heard I knew, of I knew it was going to happen I want to give you a hug because I've never China's heard of China's going to change everything. Oh, there's still Japan, Japan, though, right? It hasn't opened in Japan yet, or has yeah, it? It hasn't. It hasn't. I think it opens in uh, Japan in July. Well, there you go. Japan Maybe. is not a big yep. market. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I Just let it her works. have it, John. <laughs> okay. Japan Just will change the game. There it is. Oh, My final Twitter question comes from Raymond Morris, who writes, 3D was touted as the next big thing, but wasn't. Do you think VR will be revolutionary, or is it just another fading fad? Here's part of the problem that VR is facing. And you know, our, our VP, Mark, you hear I'm mentioning Mark around here once every once in a while. He's a huge VR guy. I mean, he'll come into, when he's visiting us from New York, he'll bring in his VR computer. He'll set up like poles of sensors and we'll have lightsaber battles. It's, it's a lot of fun. But there is two uphill battles that VR is gonna face. And maybe it can conquer these hills and maybe it can, I don't know. Number one is going to be it's an obtrusive and an intrusive kind of technology where, I mean, you've got to clear out your room, you've got to put this giant headset on your face and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so there's a little bit, there's cost involved, there's limited, right now, there's limited content involved or uh, uh, limited content available for VR, but that is changing. But the other thing is this, is that I know a lot of people who've really liked using VR stuff but can't keep a VR headset on for more than five minutes because they start getting headaches, start getting queasy. 
that is something they need to address. Now, maybe moving forward, technology can kind of change that and work out those kinks. But right now, it is a limited, it has limited viability, I think. It's going to be really interesting to see where it goes. But I just remember them saying, yeah, everything's going to be 3D. Two years from now, everything's free, 3D. And now you can't even buy a 3D t television in Best Buy anymore. Um, so it's it's got an uphill climb, but I'm going to be really... Remember, this technology is in its infancy. So let's see where it goes. I think VR absolutely has way more of a shot to become relevant and more popular than 3D because there's only so much you do with 3D. And then what, what the problem was that studios started just jumping onto it and converting it and a lot of the conversions yeah. just doesn't look good. And real 3D is fun, but it, you, you get it. It's Once once it's done and, and, and even really good 3D is like, oh, that experience was cool. How was the 3D? Oh, it was really fun. That's the best review you get out of a, a 3D as we're... VR is going to also, it's going to speak to uh, a younger audience also as they start to get more, as the technology develops, more and more of the young audiences will be experience it. They have to improve it for sure. There's, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Like, the, But I think as they do, like, I think it was Time Magazine that did a big thing on the, the development of the technology and just what they're working on and what they're trying to do and what they, if they accomplish what they can do, it's going to change the game completely of how you experience movies once you do full movies. So, so if they get it down to the way that I think that they're working on it, VR has way, because it's going to be a diff, it's not going to take away from the experience of movies. That's where sometimes 3D is like forced upon you. Like you have to go to the screen, screening, it's 3D. Then you're like, ah, you're choosing to do the VR. You're choosing to be a part of that world. I think it'll catch on eventually. I don't know. I'm, I'm on the fence with this, and it's partially because I don't really like 3D at all. I think 3D could have caught on if someone figured out a way to make a movie where you could walk out and say, like, you, the only way you can get the best possible experience with this story is if you see it in 3D, and that just never happens. So I'm looking forward to 3D just kind of fading away, so. unless, for all I know, some director out there has some brilliant idea to switch it up and actually make it worth my while. When they hit, when, when they crack the code, on glasses less 3D, it could make a resurgence. When the, when somebody finally cracks that code on 3D that you don't need to wear glasses for, we could be get it could have a resurgence. For maybe. all I know, that could that could be the fix. And and with VR, I've done some incredible VR experiences, but unless they make that technology easier to purchase, easier to set up, more comfortable to wear, I, I don't know if I see it happening, or at least not, not anytime soon, because look at where the rest of the industry is trending to easier forms of watching movies where you can watch at home and you can watch it in, in a simple click of a streaming service. So VR is almost like, the opposite of yeah, that. Yeah, but what they've done with VR just in the last year, I mean, I remember looking at certain things. They, they're, they're, it's like looking at computers, what computers were in 1985 as compared to what they are now. Like, VR is a different experience. If When they get it right and they're working on it hard, it is going to be complete. I mean, just the things when you put your phone on there and you're looking around and you're able to watch movies that particular way, that's one thing. To, and then being able to fly in, a, in an X-Wing and looking around behind you and seeing Tatooine and things like that, there's gonna be, they're going to start developing VR movies once the technology is ironed out. And I think that they are because there is a need. I think there's a excuse me, I want for it. So I think it's going to happen. I think, I think eventually VR is going to have a huge place in yeah. the theatrical cinematic experience. I don't think that you're going to have 2D go away entirely no. because people just don't like ocular apparatuses on their on their face like, like yeah. it's just it's just easier to not be wearing glasses or some huge headset that feels like dental headgear but by the time that vr becomes of prominence and the technology is there i hope any of us are still by the time that happens a blind denzel washington is going to be fighting gary oldman for the last bucket of water because it will have been the apocalypse <laughs> for seven years john I remember, uh, I think it was two years ago, Anne went to uh, E3. This is back when E3 was industry only, could be invited and stuff like that. And she, I said, what was the big thing? She said, VR was the big thing. Yeah, they were all showing off new VR. I said, cool, what was the most popular thing? And she kind of hung her head down and shook her head. I was like, what? She was by far the biggest line, and the biggest thing was off in the corner, and it was porn VR. She goes, and that was the stuff that was getting the absolute most. But hey, it's it's the industry that determined the winner between the VHS and Betamax uh, thing. So maybe maybe the industry just needs porn to break through and on VR. And once again, Invention. Demolition Man is the harbinger of the future because they have virtual <laughs> sex in Demolition Man. Every restaurant is going to be Taco Bell. Get ready for it. Use the seashells. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, Mr. Mark Ellis, where can people find you? He doesn't know how to use the seashells. You can find me at markellislive.com. Hey, I just tweeted out the really cool picture that we got from Roca. Yesterday, he met The Rock. He tweeted out a picture of The Rock with the belt. You guys want to see the movie trivia showdown with The Rock versus Kevin Hart? Get on board right now. Let's promote the hell out of this thing. Perry Nemiroff. And when you're not doing that, go promote Power Rangers because I want to see a sequel. <laughs> Let's uh, go Mongolia. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to make all the difference uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at PNMROF and go check out this weekend's behind the scenes round two of Beer Pong over here Mr. Christian Harloff Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at Christian Harloff and yeah there's more to that Roka stuff and The Rock where we'll be doing a lot more with some of the footage that he got some on Schmoes, some uh, a lot on Collider so just be looking forward to that in the next weeks to come things are brewing sitting over there of course we got Natasha Martinez you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore and of course, Wendy Lee. You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, also hoping for a Power Rangers sequel. You can simply follow me <laughs> at John Campion. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.